welcome 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 and it's nice to see you all again and and also welcome to those who will watch later of course on the online uh so we're going to be doing um over the next four weeks i believe uh going through Lamason Carpa's three principal aspects of the path a beautiful beautiful prayer that I would encourage uh if you can recite it every day it's quite complex when we get to the the latter stages talking about the correct view very complicated so we may generate uh, dedicate like two weeks to that section I'm not really sure how we'll go like I like to keep it a little bit fluid I've got a plan in mind um, and the intention at this stage would be two weeks on that one week on bodhicitta the second principal aspect and this week on the first renunciation uh, so let's see if that unfolds whatever unfolds just may it be meaningful and uh may it may it uh hit home to what we perhaps need to work on and um may we at least plant seeds and those seeds definitely based on the laws of causality are definite that you know if we take care of them if we you know water them and so forth they'll definitely sprout and definitely fruit so you know there is no doubt that if we uh plant these seeds these causes they would definitely bring great great results so even if at first it's a little complicated and maybe that's not where we're quite at just be so patient and kind and and encouraging you know we have to be our own number one fans not with a sense of ego but with a sense of you know perseverance joyous effort encouraging uh, never giving up and and uh and slowly slowly starting to believe that we can achieve you know these great things that are outlined so that would be my intention I think it's a, a wonderful idea if it's okay with you that we do start with uh you know generating a strong motivation together and doing refuge and uh, to make it a Buddhist practice and then we can go from there okay also if you have questions throughout I'm very very happy to receive them and I prefer to receive them at the appropriate time so if I was in the middle of a sentence or something maybe just you know pause your thought oh Michael I've had it before or like the chat let the chat be purposeful meaningful um you know not just a, a rambling of thoughts as they enter our mind because as soon as they enter our mind we're all going to divert our attention to the chat and thinking that that's the most important thing we need right now so pick your times wisely you'll know when to um, offer something share something ask something you know all of this is wonderful because we're all beginners we're all learning this together and so we can all definitely help each other so just finding that right time is perfect okay so I'll just get it uh, set up on the screen share and um, I'll just allow cookies and go in I'm assuming you can see uh, the screen that I hang on a second. I just want to make sure it's clear background. I'm assuming you can see easily there. Yes. Thank you, Michael. You've got this mudra and the Buddha behind you as your background's got this mudra, but you're both sort of in, in unison. So this is a good sign. All right. And I just want to be able to see you guys. Okay. All right. So, yeah, let's just take a moment. You know you guys have had a busy day mine's just getting started same with with jai jay in australia but how incredibly fortunate how incredibly precious our lives are that in each moment we can make it meaningful We have all the conditions present internally with this body, this mind, which comes with the intelligence and so forth. We have all the internal conditions complete to even achieve enlightenment in this very life.
We are so blessed to have all the external conditions complete. To be in the family of FPMT. Introduced to the Buddha's teachings. Sutra and Tantra. And to have met the most supreme of all precious holy gurus. And guided by the Venerable Sangha, most precious Geshe Sherub and all the others. And so, with all these inner and outer conditions complete, sometimes we have to think what stops us from achieving enlightenment in one lifetime, as the teachings say. What is it for you that stops you? Perhaps it's our laziness, our procrastination, our not believing in ourselves, not recognizing our Buddha potential. Perhaps it's still developing a conviction in the teachings or past and future lives. Whatever it is for you personally, mentally note, there's more work to be done here. Sometimes we've got to fake it till we make it. And so with as much heart, conviction, and Buddha Dharma Sangha, as much faith that we can put together, seeing this as the infallible path, infallible perfect guides guiding us, Help us along the way we meet, moving us in the direction of attaining Buddha Dharma Sangha in our own continuum. We can go for refuge. Remember, Buddha Dharma Sangha is for those desirous of liberation. We want to be free of suffering, free of the lower realms in particular, samsara in general, free of afflictive obscurations, knowledge obscurations, that which hinders our very enlightenment in being able to do perfect work for sentient beings to bring them to consummate happiness. And so with the causes complete of fear and faith, having a sense of our own wishing to be free of suffering, renunciation, moving the heart, to not only free ourselves, but to generate that compassion to free others. And seeing that all of this is made possible because the reason, because things are empty of inherent existence. Therefore, they are a dependent arising. And so all this development we seek is made possible 
due to emptiness. And so we can go for refuge together and trying to hold the three principal aspects of the path in our mind as well. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Okay, so having laid the, the foundations there, um, because this is Lama Tsongkhapa's prayer and he has composed it, I'd like us to proceed um, in a way that perhaps may be most helpful by trying to keep in our mind that Lama Tsongkhapa has written these 14 verses for me. So you guys think for me, you know, he's written them for us, but really bring it home by, by personalizing it, you know, for me, these verses are written for me. And so what we can do is Guru Shakyamuni Buddha, our precious holy gurus, if we have them, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Kabji Lama Zubrimpeche, these precious holy beings are inseparable from Guru Lama Tsongkhapa. And Guru Lama Tsongkhapa, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha is the fourth, Maitreya the fifth. I believe Shak um, Lama Tsongkhapa will be the 11th Buddha to come to this world system. And so a Buddha in actuality, you know, we can really try to invoke the presence of Lama Tsongkhapa. And as we proceed through the prayer, when we recite it at home, trying to be, having invoked, be in the presence of Lama Tsongkhapa. And so I just thought maybe it'd be nice to um, keep that in mind as a, as a way of invocation to, you know, to recite Lama Tsongkhapa's holy name mantra. And it doesn't have to be sung or anything like this, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's just about, you know, bringing that feeling. So uh, we, maybe we could say it three times together. Um, I say, Oma Guru Vajradara Samati Kati Siddhi Hum Hum. Oma Guru Vajradara Samati Kati Siddhi Hum Hum. Oma Guru Vajradara Samati Kati Siddhi Hum Hum. And we can imagine Lama Tsongkhapa in front of us and sending forth purifying white rays of nectar and light. And all of the things that we identified, that we noted at the beginning of our personal hindrances, what stops us from achieving enlightenment, we can imagine in the presence of Lama Tsongkhapa that he helps us to purify those very personal hindrances that stop us from being able to realize these teachings. And as the white light and nectar hits the areas of our body and mind, we can imagine that it destroys these wrong concepts, these wrong minds, non-virtuous minds of laziness and so forth, wrong views if we don't accept past and future lives or whatever it was that you identified. And what stops us from generating the three principal aspects in our mind is generally, we can say, the eight worldly concerns or eight worldly dharmas stops our renunciation. 
So see that as being purified as well. With these white lights generated from lamas and copper, touching our heart, filling our body and mind. What stops our bodhicitta from developing is self-cherishing, so we can purify that. And what stops us developing the correct view, the wisdom realizing emptiness, is primarily our self-grasping. And so requesting Lama Tsongkhapa's help to purify that as well with these white rays of nectar and light. And so from the having purified all of our hindrances, then we can just briefly look over <clears throat> the preliminaries. I don't want to spend too much time on this because it really is something that we could spend, you know, four weeks on in itself. So I just want to move quite quickly through the preliminaries. These three principal aspects of the path obviously are like the, you know, from the Mahayana perspective, you know, it's it's the essence and the heart of, you know, the entire path to enlightenment. And so these three principal aspects of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, correct view, they're really coming more so like in the, the middle scope the stages of the path shared with the beings of the middle scope and the great scope. So necessarily, therefore, the foundations are going to be the stages of the path shared with beings in common with the small scope. So, you know, um, firstly, the, the prayer begins with a line of homage. Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, I bow down to my perfect gurus, and his main guru was, was uh, Manjushri, who he received directly teachings from. Um, so guru devotion, you know, is one of the, the foundations that we learn in the, the, the small stages of the path. And if we wish to generate any realizations, we need the blessings of the guru. So independence on our reliance on a spiritual friend, an infallible spiritual friend that meets the, the qualifications, not just anybody, but has those 10 qualities or, or a portion of, then independence on the guru independence on that reliance, that proper devotion, we receive the inspiration. The, the blessings are like the inspiration. They move the mind. They, they make it malleable. They make, they water the, the mind. They make it moist instead of rock hard, you know. And so, so when, when it's moist, then those seeds can ripen and sprout and fruit and so forth. So, you know, this, this is not something that I'll be spending time on but it is something that individually we need to look into, investigate, look at the reasons and logic that support it. And when you're, when you're able, when you're ready, then um, launch into, you know, supporting one's practice with guru devotion. So independence on the, the holy guru, this is how the three principal aspects are realized. Whether we look at the three scopes, small, middling, and great, and the three goals of those. So whether it be the small, the goal of the small scope practitioner is to attain the happiness of future lives, but it's still within samsara. So it's still suffering, you know. We have that fortunate upper realm rebirth that the small scope practitioner would be aiming for, and yet we still suffer. We still have problems. We still have not completed the, the path to happiness. We get sprinklings of happiness, which keeps us going. Uh, but, you know, still, nevertheless, we face many problems in our life and and some to the, to the detriment where they even paralyze us in our going forth. So we want to go beyond that small scope goal of 
happiness of future lives. We want to go beyond the middling scope goal of liberation for oneself alone. And we want to bring all of these as a foundation uh, preliminaries so that we can focus on the great goal of enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings. That's our causal motivation for the welfare of all sentient beings to enact uh, you know, the most benefit for them. And the most benefit is not just bringing them temporary happiness, that too, but bringing them to enlightenment. And the only way we can do that is for ourselves to attain enlightenment, to know the path, to then reveal the path. So for the welfare of all sentient beings, I must achieve enlightenment. So we, we develop that body cheater and that goal of enlightenment. And so all of this is wrapped up within the, the, um, perfect pure guru you know the the teacher of the three scopes independence on which we can achieve the three goals so this proper reliance on the spiritual friend is is the very foundation if we are to receive any of the blessings and then on basis of blessings inspiration that motivates us to practice to become exactly like the guru we develop the higher qualities and the higher qualities we're seeking is not merely the three higher trainings built on the basis, the method of renunciation to, to have, you know, a foundation in ethics and concentration and wisdom, not merely that we're seeking more than that. We're seeking to develop on the basis, the method of bodhicitta to incorporate in our practice, to develop the, the five paths, 10 grounds by, you know, uh, developing the higher practice of the perfection of generosity, you know, ethics, generosity, patience, concentration, you know, wisdom, and and we need joyous effort for all of this. So all of this coming together to complete this, the six perfections. So <clears throat> the next verse one actually looks at uh, the promise to compose. So Lama Tsongkhapa is, is making a, a promise here that he's going to complete, once he starts, he's going to complete the three principal aspects of the path for us. And these lines, some people actually um, identify them as relating them to renunciation, bodhicitta, and wisdom, realizing emptiness, the correct view. Not everyone does, but, um, you know, those that do separate those lines, not everyone does, but those that do, Renunciation is this first line, this is the essential meaning of the victorious one's teachings, because without renunciation, we cannot develop bodhicitta, which follows as the second principal aspect. And without renunciation, we will not investigate what is the correct view and develop that correct view. If we don't wish to be free of samsara and to seek freedom beyond samsara, then we're not going to seek what is the correct view, are we? And if we don't get in touch with our own suffering of how we, we suffer within this life, in our beginningless lives, in our future lives, while we remain in cyclic existence, we are pervaded by suffering. So unless we develop renunciation that wishes to separate to be free from suffering and achieve liberation, liberation or great liberation enlightenment, unless we develop that renunciation in our mind by identifying our own suffering and wanting to be free of it, there's no way we can then turn the spotlight from our own, ourself, our own suffering and wanting to be free to others and seeing them as suffering and wanting them to be free so without renunciation we cannot go on to develop bodhicitta without renunciation we won't seek the correct view which is the the wisdom that is coupled with the the method to actually be what frees us what cuts the root to cyclic existence what destroys it entirely to become liberated or enlightenment so the essential meaning of all the Buddha's teachings, uh, some attribute to this renunciation, this first principal aspect of the path, because it's from there we develop the subsequent ones. And that second line for those that do separate this prayer out to the three principal aspects is looking at bodhicitta. So the path praised by all the, the victors, the Buddhas and their children, the bodhisattvas, 
So this is, um, you know, how we can direct, make this life most meaningful by in each moment directing it towards enlightenment so that with renunciation, all our actions could become a cause for liberation. But with bodhicitta, we go beyond that and they all of our actions can become a cause for enlightenment. Okay, so this is how in each moment we can make this precious human life most meaningful, but we won't achieve either goal of liberation or enlightenment unless we have the correct view. And so this gateway of the fortunate ones desiring liberation, this gateway, what's going to open the door to become free is actually the correct view, the wisdom realizing emptiness. And so um you know, it, already in this promise to compose, Lama Tsongkhapa has introduced the three principal aspects of the path. All right. So I just said I was going to go through that quite quickly. Now, verse two is persuading us to be able to, to take these teachings to heart. So remember, we're in the, the preliminaries. And so uh, here we're talking about three features and perhaps we we already hold these and if if we do we rejoice how wonderful and if we don't yet have them then we see this is the work that we've got to do so this is this is the playground that I've got to you know get it get messy in and actually try to develop uh, these qualities these attributes so always with a gentleness you know we are perhaps very far from enlightenment, but still when we compare ourselves to, you know, 7 billion people or something, you know, just humans in this world, or, or look at all the, you know, other forms of beings, countless forms of sentient beings, we're actually doing quite well. So we need to always remember, be our number one fan with, not with a sense of arrogance and pride, but just to try to counter our putting ourselves down, our diminishing what our capabilities are, to seeing our Buddha potential, seeing that we have all, everything that we need right now to, to actually, you know, implement these teachings and bring them to fruition so with a very gentle mind we can assess do we have these three features are we the fortunate ones in this fourth line that we need to listen with a calm mind an undisturbed mind to these teachings that Lama Tsongkhapa has written for us so the three features of a fortunate one this first line indicates those who are not attached to the pleasures of circling in samsara. Okay, so this is a hard one. So this is quite hard I well, for me anyway. So we talked about the three scopes, small, middling, and great. Even before we come that special being that is a small, capable being that seeks the happiness of future lives, even before that, a lot of us are way back just as ordinary or worldly mundane beings, not yet any of the three scopes. And we're so consumed just with the happiness of this life alone that we don't necessarily look to the happiness of future lives all the time because we get we get hooked in, we get uh, caught up in the desires and the attachments and and the the seeking of pleasures, the sensory pleasures, and and wanting people to think well of us, and you know seeking that form of happiness, and and um, you know seeking with, that we have good reputations, and you know all the different things that we we get caught up with, hooked by these eight worldly concerns, and and wanting to be separated from you know any form of loss or or people thinking bad of us criticizing us you know having bad reputation or coming into contact with objects that bring displeasure you know most of the time in our daily life we're quite hooked by these eight worldly concerns and so we sabotage our our you know aspirations to go beyond and so if we are a fortunate one, we need to work at not being attached to these pleasures. So we need to, instead of renouncing the Dharma by being hooked by the eight worldly concerns, we need to move beyond that. And a small scope being, 
would renounce attachment to this life. They would renounce the eight worldly concerns like that, and they would be renouncing attachment to this life to focus on the happiness of future lives. But also the next scope, which we want to have as our foundation, the middle scope, they renounce attachment to all of samsara, not only the suffering of suffering, but the pleasures, what we call the suffering of change, the contaminated pleasures, and even the third level of suffering, the pervasive suffering of conditionality, which as an illustration is this body and mind that has taken rebirth under the control of karma and afflictions. And so this contaminated rebirth is primed like a ticking time bomb in each moment, ready to meet with the suffering of suffering or the suffering of change. At any moment, we don't believe it, but at any moment, death can come, the breath can stop. You know, So while we're controlled by karma and afflictions, while we have this contaminated aggregates, this contaminated body and mind, then that's what the, the middle scope being is going to be renouncing with samsara and seeking liberation from. And so then they're going to be not attached to the pleasures of cyclic existence, the suffering of change, but also that third suffering, the pervasive suffering of conditionality. So we can assess where we're at with that one. And maybe that's where we have a lot of work to do to try to overcome the, the pleasures, to give up the eight worldly concerns, to meditate on suffering, because suffering has great purpose, has great benefits. And maybe we'll talk more about that later, but certainly Shanti Deva, uh, chapter six, verse 21, suffering has good qualities, you know, wonderful verse. Um, so, you know, meditating on how to develop this renunciation by overcoming the eight worldly concerns, which will stop renunciation, meditating on, you know, suffering and so forth, meditating on how even the suffering of change is, is suffering and wanting to be free of that. And then this third suffering. Now, if we are a fortunate one that um, this prayer is written for us, remember, maybe it's not for us right this moment, but it will be if we plant the seeds. Um, the other one is who strive to make freedoms and endowments meaningful. So there it's talking about freedoms and endowments, um, freedoms and richnesses. So it's talking about the, the precious human rebirth. So those who strive to make this precious human rebirth meaningful, these are the ones that Lama Tsongkhapa has written this prayer for so that we can direct in each moment our, our life to creating causes for enlightenment. And then who entrust this third line, entrust themselves to the path pleasing the Buddhas, the victorious ones. So with a joyous effort, then we place our confidence, our faith, our confidence in the path that is the three principal aspects, the essence of the entire path to enlightenment. So that's um, these three fortunate qualities um, if we've got them rejoice otherwise make a note of um, you know where we've got some work to attend to so remember we want to instead of renouncing the dharma by being consumed by the eightly worldly eight worldly concerns we want to renounce attachment to this life but we want to focus on more than just the uh, happiness of future lives we want to renounce that too and we want to focus more than just on achieving liberation. We want to renounce that as well and actually focus on the goal of enlightenment. So not liberating ourselves just for ourselves alone, but to actually be of the greatest purpose, to have fully abandoned our obscurations, not just a portion, and to have fully developed all realizations, not just a portion. So that's why we're seeking full enlightenment. Then we can be fully complete in our realizations and abandonments, and more importantly, in our qualities to be able to help others. So some apply each of these lines in that way of this first line referring to renunciation, not being attached to samsara, but seeking liberation. The next one, bodhicitta, are the beings who make the perfect human rebirth most meaningful in each moment by de dedicating it to enlightenment. So they're the ones who strive. And 
those who attribute a line to a three principal aspect, this third one, they, oh, excuse me, they're, um, they're actually referring to the correct view of emptiness there, who entrust themselves to the path. The path that pleases the victorious ones is the path to liberation. So remember the Buddha said, I reveal the path of liberation, but liberation itself depends on you. So it's us who have to develop that path in our mind to actually proceed to liberation. And the only way to do that would be with the method of renunciation or bodhicitta and the wisdom that is common to both the wisdom realizing lack of inherent existence. Okay. So then we get to renunciation. So I just want to just stop for a second just to see where, where you're at. And how do I do this? I've got a new computer finally. So I'm just still learning it. My other one was threatening death for such a long time and, and didn't didn't kid me, did um die for four days. So anyway, so excuse me if I'm a little bit haphazard with um I've only had this computer a week. So I'm just wondering before we go on to look at the three principal aspects in, in relation to renunciation, um, emerging, you know, from samsara, emerging from dissatisfaction, if there are any uh, questions or any things that, that one needs to bring up or address, um, where are you at at the moment? Most of you are, you know, quite experienced. I've seen your faces are around before, so I'm just sort of skipping over some things and and trusting that you either have heard them before or you can easily write them down to make a note of um, what you need to investigate. Is there any um, particular questions or anything at the moment? I just have one question. Of uh, course, Michael. Which translation are you using for this? Are you using uh, Lama Zopa's translation? Yes, I, I am. I prefer Jeffrey Hopkins one because it's the one I, I recite every day uh, from years ago, which was in Cutting Through Appearances, um, a wonderful text. Uh, but because we're FPMT, I am using, Michael, the, the latest version of uh, the one translated by Kabje Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And is it okay then if I put it in the chat so that everybody will have it? Yeah, as long as you've got the latest one there, have you? I believe so. Just do it anyway, because the the um, the verses won't change too much. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think it's on that note, I think it's good to refer to many translations. I know when I studied this topic with Bill McGee in a Tibetan course, uh, we looked at uh, Paul Hackett's. We looked at um, Tupton Jimpas and, um, and, yeah, Jeffrey's. And uh, yeah, and Lamazo Primpiches as well. So it's good to to go through and, and look at various translations because each of them will give a different flavor to certain points. And depending on your own karma, it might illuminate something that it hasn't before. So it's worthwhile um, doing that. Thanks, Michael. Maybe we can just uh, pause for a moment and, and do a little bit of a reflection. Does that some, sound like an option? Yeah? Okay, let's do that then. Excuse me a second. Okay, so I'd like to, you to get specific and bring to mind one of the biggest problems you're having right now, hopefully it's not me. <laughs> it has an end. There you go. Hang in there. So bring to mind one of, one of the biggest problems that we're going through. I mean, there's so many to choose from right now. Um, personalize it as much as possible. One might be having health problems, family problems, relationship problems, work problems. Some mental illness or depression, anxiety.
and just allow yourself to to actually feel quite strongly the mind that's thinking of this as a problem so how we've labeled it problem allow that mind to arise vividly Allow the discomfort, the discontent, the unhappy mind that sees this as a problem. You might notice some aversion with this mind. It might try to push it away. But just allow it to be present. And then we can go on to think that while we are in samsara, pervaded by suffering under the control of karma and afflictions, this is the very nature of samsara, to have problems, to have pain, suffering, separation from loved ones, anxiety, and so forth. And so instead of the script being focused on, I don't deserve this problem, why am I having this problem? We can flip that script and think, well, why not? Instead of why, why not? This is what we have signed up for through our actions, our afflictions, our disturbing emotions. But I think the pertinent question here is why do I continue to endure samsara and all its dissatisfaction all of its immense suffering why do I continue to endure it Is the little sprinkling of happiness here and there really enough? This human rebirth we have is coming to an end with each out breath with each beat of the heart the tick of the clock
And there's no guarantee that we'll find ourselves in another human rebirth, but actually experiencing measurable suffering in the lower realms. So why do I endure samsara? Why do I not seek lasting happiness? In each moment, throughout my entire day, So before we started by thinking, this reflection, we started by thinking of a problem, a personal problem we're experiencing. So this problem can be our reminder, our perfect reminder to be free of samsara, to be free of all problems. If we didn't have this problem that we're currently experiencing, maybe we would become complacent and accept life's not so bad. Samsara is not so bad. So in this way, whatever problems arise, we can use renunciation as a method which transforms the problem into fuel for liberation and enlightenment. With renunciation, we can befriend whatever arises that would normally cause us anxiety, depression, anger, frustration. Shanti Deva also said. Without suffering, there is no renunciation. Does anyone want to share why why we don't why we're happy to endure put up with samsara what what is it if you want to share what is it that stops us making great inroads what stops us from you know more than just our morning meditation, evening meditation, and classes we go to. What in in the in between times? What stops us from actually wanting to get out of samsara? Inertia, William. Yeah, I've got me some of that. Sad, hey. 
Anyone else? What stops you? Why, why small views from David and Erin, Habits, Kathleen? Oh, Kathleen's here. There you are. I was thinking of um, from Canada, but different person, I think. Yeah. So there's a lot to work with there, isn't there? A lot of habit as well, inertia. You know, all of this stuff is um, for, fuel for us to, to think, well, yes, I have this. And not having a, a big enough view to see the, the picture. And this is where Lama Sankarpa is going to bring together the entire path to enlightenment and, you know, bring up, um, you know, ad address uh, how we can stop this inertia and, and develop new habits and so forth. So let's look at... Um, the the renunciation verses let me see if i can do this share okay all right so renunciation so what we're going to look at is um basically firstly we'll look at what it's not just to make sure we've overcome the misconceptions of what renunciation is not what it is, why we need it, and then we'll look at cultivating a continuum. So we may not have the renunciation yet, okay, developed in our mind in an uncontrived way, certainly, but um, we can look at cultivating a continuum of that. So what we can do now that will transform to become that, first in a contrived way, then uncontrived, and then when it's uncontrived, we attain a path. So there's things we can do now that are going to lead into becoming renunciation in the future, and then we'll unpack the, the verses. So this definite emergence, this renunciation, different translations, different flavors. So definite emergence, emerging from what? Emerging from samsara, going where? Emerging from something, going to something. So emerging from samsara to liberation. So definite emergence is about not generating admiration for the pleasures of samsara, these contaminated, fraudulent uh, suffering of change, you know, and instead genuinely seeking liberation. So this is what we want to do with definite emergence. A lot of giving up attachment, isn't it? So what it is not. All right. So firstly, you don't have to put everything on, you know, Craigslist or whatever it is. I, I don't do those apps, but um, you don't have to sell everything you've got um, and give up everything completely. Move out of, you know, what David, you're safe. Erin, you're safe. You know, you don't have to give up relationships and all possessions and all of these sorts of things. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay. It's not about denying ourselves happiness and rejecting all forms of, of pleasure or enjoyment. This is not the case. So renunciation is a state of mind for a start, okay? So physical things like relationships, you know, physical with other people and possessions, physical things is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a mind. So giving up everything completely is not what renunciation is. It's about cultivating the mind of non-attachment in relation to those things, seeing them as impermanent, that things, you know, arise, they, they're in a, they arise and they're in a state of decay from their very state of having arisen. They don't abide or remain and uh, eventually they'll, they'll cease. So, so what of these objects brings me this lasting happiness what is there to cling on to as lasting happiness in this object and you know with renunciation we will see that that they are just fraudulent that there's nothing to hold on to it's kind of like I was thinking this morning it's kind of like trying to uh, hold on to a rainbow or something like this you know like it's just impossible to to hold on to these objects in, in, in them anyway bringing a sense of happiness or lasting pleasure Renunciation is not denying ourselves happiness. We do need pleasure, okay? So it's not about denying ourselves pleasure and saying, oh, I'm never going to, you know, 
whatever brings you pleasure. I'm never going to do that again. It's not about that as well. You know, as this, in this precious human rebirth, we do need to still um, enjoy ourselves and, and not be miserable all the time and, you know, have little delights. The problem is not in the object. The problem is in the mind in relation to the object. So, and so that's something as, as well. Um, it's not about avoiding or running away or, you know, when things get difficult, we try to, you know, escape, escape to the Himalayas or wherever we go. So renunciation is, is not about that. It's not about retreating from the, the world in isolation. Doesn't mean retreat and isolation, physical isolation is not good at times. Of course it is. But mental isolation is more important. So isolating from the afflictions, isolating from the worldly concerns, these sorts of things. And it's certainly not, um, you know, um, avoiding, running away, escaping when things get difficult. It's certainly not just being inert. So being resigned to how things are, you know, this is a very determined mind. So it's very focused on what it wants to achieve. Freedom from samsara, liberation. When we think of liberation, because we're practicing the Mahayana path, we can think of liberation as greater liber great liberation being, you know, enlightenment, because that's what we're seeking. Um, so we can think of it in that way. So yeah, this this determined mind. So that's what it's not. It's not about self denial or you know. Um, living the austere life and all this sort of stuff, not having things, um, but letting go of attachment to them. And um, what it is, is, is the mind, I should have bolded that bit as well, the mind wishing, so it's an aspiration, the mind wishing to definitely emerge from suffering, the suffering of samsara and its causes, wanting to, to get out of uh, this body and mind under the control of karma and afflictions, wanting to be free of true origins which cause true suffering. This body and mind is true suffering. So wanting to be free of suffering and what's caused it, karma and afflictions. If we, The only way to be free of true origins that bring about true sufferings is to cultivate true paths renunciation, bodhicitta, wisdom realizing emptiness, okay, true paths, to cultivate true paths, to bring about true cessation, liberation. So what it is, is that state of mind. It's not having the slightest attachment to samsaric pleasures, even for an instant, and it wants to seek liberation. When that becomes in each moment active without having to generate reasons to, to you know, make it um, appear in our mind, then it's going to be an uncontrived mind of definite emergence or uncontrived renunciation. Different translations, but same thing. So it's got these two aspects, wanting to be emerged from samsara to the result of liberation or enlightenment. So two aspects, okay? Emerging from to liberation. Emerging from samsara to liberation or enlightenment in our case. Okay? So opposite, or let's see what I've got next. So why do we need it? Well, we need renunciation. You might think, oh, it's a middle scope practice. I'm practicing the great scope. Well, that's not true. The middle scope are stages of the path shared in common. They're in common with us. We need them. So we need renunciation. Even if we're aspiring, you know, bodhisattvas, we need renunciation to attain liberation from cyclic existence under the control of karma and afflictions. Okay. We need it because we want to be free of our own suffering. When we have the mind of renunciation that wants to be free of our own suffering, then equal to that will be the level of our great compassion that we can develop in relation to others. 
if we don't see ourselves as suffering now, then there's no way we can genuinely, purely wish that all other beings be free of suffering because we're not in touch with what suffering is. What we're thinking suffering is is probably the first suffering, the suffering of pain. We want people to be free of that manifest suffering of going through you know, hardship and wars and, and terror and, and fear and you know, all of the, the, the dysfunction that goes on in human realms, but other realms as well. We probably want them to be free of just that. Well, that's wonderful. That's compassion for sure. But it's not the great compassion that we're talking about here. So naturally, we all want, we have that seed of compassion in us that we want beings to be free of suffering. We even want our enemies to be free of that suffering, that first suffering, because we do have a good heart. But how much do we want them to be free of the, the pleasures? How much do we want them to be free of contaminated happiness? You know what I mean? If you see people enjoying themselves, do you walk around thinking, oh, I wish they were free of suffering right now? You're usually caught up in the moment with them and, and delighting in their delight or something like this, right? So renunciation is not even that, though. We're not talking about just being free of suffering of change. We're talking about the third suffering. So if we've got to have this renunciation to practice the path, we need to get in touch with that third suffering, that pervasive suffering of conditionality, how in each moment this body and mind is at the ready to experience suffering of change, suffering of pain, to experience uncontrolled death, rebirth, and so forth, sickness, aging. Okay? so. So it's that third suffering that's most important here. So if we become in touch with that third suffering and wanting ourselves to be free of that, to be free of samsara and what causes it, then our renunciation is going to be complete. It's going to be strong. Then we shift the spotlight over to others. May they be free of that suffering. May they be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, true origins, true suffering, samsara. Okay, so you can see how we can't bypass renunciation. We need renunciation to develop great compassion, to develop bodhicitta, to attain enlightenment, and of course, you know, for liberation for the small scope. Okay, so let's uh, jump in and have a look at the verses. All right, the purpose. So these these prayers are wonderfully set out. Um, it's firstly highlighting the reason or the purpose of why we need to develop uh, these these very practice these three principal aspects of the path, and um, so first the purpose. Then he's going to show us the method or how to develop them, and then he's going to show us the measure or the criteria so we can know if we have actually developed it or not. So purpose or reason, method, measure, or the criteria that we've completed. That's generally the structure. So let's have a look. The purpose of renunciation, without the complete intention definitely to be free from circling, there is no way to pacify attachment seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. So without the complete intention to be free of samsara, we are going to remain seduced by the perfections of cyclic existence. We are going to be constantly caught up in craving for cyclic existence. So craving, grasping, you know, all intensified forms of attachment. On, it comes out of on the basis of ignorance, grasping at a self. And embodied beings are continuously bound. So also by craving for cyclic existence, embodied beings are continuously bound, bound to circle in samsara, bound by karma and afflictions. Therefore, at the very beginning, you know, the the um, the 
the essence here of the essential meaning of what we're aiming for at the very beginning is renunciation. So here, Lama Tsongkhapa has written for each of you this verse to highlight the importance of cultivating true renunciation. Without renunciation, we exclusively seek only the pleasures of samsara. Check that up if that's true for you. Are we going from one, you know, experience of happiness to another? And we're constantly just, every every action we do pretty much, even a movement of a readjusting ourselves on the, the cushion or the chair is seeking a freedom from some sort of suffering that's set in and seeking some sort of, you know, freedom from that, some sort of pleasure. Obviously, loads of sense pleasures we indulge with every day. So without renunciation, we exclusively seek. So these are mutually exclusive, aren't they? Seeking only the happiness of this lifetime and the, the happiness of future lives within samsara or that complete intent, intention definitely to be free of that, to go beyond that, to renounce that. These are really contradictory, aren't they? We either seek them and indulge in them or we seek to be free from them and renounce them. We need to turn away from the second suffering and even that third suffering. So I think I've emphasized that enough there. So we need to have that determination, that strong mind, that determined mind to be free from the bondage of samsara. So that's the purpose. We want to become free of samsara. We need to give up attachment and craving. We need to, you know, think of the 12 links. I'll, I think I've got a message here about the 12 links. 189 are afflictions. What have we got? We've got ignorance. We've got craving and attachment. These are afflictions. And also we've got the, the second link and the 10th link. These are karmas. So um, what is it? The contaminated karma. What is it? What do we call that second link? I've got a memory blank because I'm not thinking at the minute. Um, ignorance. There's so many different translations for it. Anyway. Contaminated. I can't think. Doesn't matter. It's not important. It's what get everything gets lumped into there anyway. It's talking about karma. When we plant seeds, when we do an action, um, those seeds get planted in that you know that mind stream and stuff. And those karmas that we plant in the mind stream, they at number ten can become ripened and project us into a future rebirth. And then, you know, we see how we continue to circle under true origins. These karma and afflictions are true origins. So while we have craving, um, particularly that craving and grasping, that eight and ninth link, where we have that craving for psychic existence, craving for the pleasures of samsara, we're never going to be able to get free. So all of this is why we need to develop renunciation and, and give up attachment give up a craving naturally we've got to give up what um precedes craving and precedes attachment and that is the self-grasping ignorance the ignorance that grasp that inherently existent i so on the basis of that we develop attachment cravings and create karma and then from that that sequence then we create so this is true origins isn't it from self-grasping and afflictions and karma these are our true origins we produce suffering suffering in samsara uncontrolled birth sickness aging death and so forth everything like that so in determining to be free we have to learn to give up these things we have to pacify attachment unless we pacify attachment there's no way we can proceed to develop renunciation Unless we give up our craving, there's no way we can ever be free. We'll only create more and more causes of circling in samsara. So at the very beginning, we need to seek this renunciation. This is the reason why we need to do it, because we want to be free of circling. We want to get out of samsara. And so therefore, we need to develop renunciation. How do we do it, though? Well, Lama Tsongkhapa has written a couple of verses for us here. He says, freedoms and endowments 
So it's a precious human rebirth, isn't it? Freedoms and endowments are difficult to find, pointing to the difficulties of how we attain a precious human rebirth. And life has no time to spare, talking about death and impermanence. So these are small scopes, aren't they? In the teachings, small scopes. By gaining familiarity with this, attraction to the appearances of this life is reversed. So even as a small scope practitioner, we need to look at precious human rebirth, death and impermanence, okay? To give up the attraction to the appearances of this life because a small scope practitioner is renouncing this life and they're seeking the happiness of future lives. So you can see how the, the small scope is really our foundation here for developing renunciation. So work to be done, checklist, eight, eight worldly concerns. Am I quite consumed with them? Do I put a lot of emphasis in gain? and pleasure, and having, you know, uh, a good reputation, and people praising us, not criticizing, you know, amassing sensory pleasures and, and having happiness? Or do I equalize them so that it doesn't matter if, it, if I get praised or criticized, if people think well of me or not, if I have happiness from sensory pleasures or not, it doesn't matter. Have we equalized them? Can we see the, the downfalls of being praised and the, you know, and, and wish to be free of the mind that seeks praise and good reputation? We've got to try to equalize these eight worldly concerns so that we're not consumed by them, that we're not renouncing Dharma, okay, by being caught in them. How to make this precious human rebirth meaningful? We can look at our meditation outlines on precious human rebirth. Um, we can, you know, make sure that we're trying our best to live in vows, pratamoksha vows, bodhisattva vows, tantric vows, uh, that we are, you know, doing our best to cultivate virtue because with this precious human rebirth, we want a succession of precious human rebirths or rebirth in a pure land otherwise. And on the basis of a succession of precious human rebirths, attaining high status, rebirth in the upper realms, we can also um, achieve definite goodness, which is liberation and enlightenment. So right now with this precious human rebirth, we have everything we need right here and now. If we can get over our inertia, we can uh, implement these strategies of how to develop renunciation by doing meditations on precious human rebirth death and impermanence there is no time to waste okay we need to stop procrastinating waiting to practice dharma when we get older or when i finish work when i retire you know when i have more resources for this or that whatever the you know the the excuse is in each moment with a body cheetah motivation, we can make this life most meaningful. So it's not giving up whatever you are doing, right? It's doing it with a body cheetah motivation so that it becomes most meaningful. And, and it doesn't matter. It could be caring for an elderly parent, something so precious, so precious. And seeing that parent as one with all kind mother sentient beings and serving them, devoting to them as we do to the precious Lama, doing it as a means of, you know, taking care of all sentient beings, doing it with a bodhicitta motivation. Then every time we dress the, 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 the elderly parent or feed them or, or help them drink or bathe them, dress, dress them, brush their teeth for them, brush their hair, make them feel beautiful, whatever it is that we're doing to care for that elderly person, okay? Taking them to the toilet, something when they're most vulnerable, we can be doing with that bodhicitta motivation. So, and this can be a way that we're we're making this life most meaningful. And obviously for bodhicitta, we need to have renunciation. So wanting that they be free of suffering, wanting ourselves to be free of suffering, we can try to bring in all of this to see how 
all the appearances of this life that we usually cling to are, are deceptive and wanting to go beyond it. So we have secured a precious human rebirth. We have created ethics in the past. We are creating ethics in the present. And so we're creating causes again with our ethics, with our practice of the six perfections, with our aspirational prayers. We're creating causes again and again to achieve a precious human rebirth. So we're very fortunate. We are the fortunate ones that Lama Tsongkhapa is addressing but we know how difficult it is to find this precious human rebirth. And so, you know, we want to make sure we take to heart these earlier preparations in how to develop renunciation. This is the method. So gaining conviction in these earlier teachings. But this is, remember, giving up attraction to the appearances of this life. We haven't even yet got to the small scope practitioner that gives up attraction to the, hang on, I misspoke. The Giving up attraction to the appearances of this life is the practice of the small scope practitioner. We haven't even yet got to the middle scope where they even give up the attraction to the appearances of future lives happiness. That's what I meant to say. Apologies. So this precious human rebirth has a multitude of causes and conditions coming together. It's supremely rare. It's of the highest value. You know, bodhisattvas in some pure realms actually make prayers to have a precious human rebirth. They make aspirational prayers from pure lands. I mean, get your head around that, right? So this is something that we have that they don't. We have the body with all of these particular elements that the bodhisattva is seeking so that they can use these elements to practice, for instance, sutra and tantra and achieve enlightenment in one lifetime. Whilst we have it, it's quickly lost. There's, life has no time to spare. So death and impermanence is always with us. We must act. And so we have all these internal conditions. So moving beyond this inertia. Okay, so the second verse he talks about now is giving up attraction to the appearances of future lives. So by thinking over and over again, so again and again, that actions and their effects. Actions is talking about karma and their effects. So actions, karma and results. By thinking over and over again, that actions and their effects are unbetraying. So we're talking about teachings on karma here and repeatedly contemplating the miseries of cyclic existence, the eight sufferings, the six sufferings, the three sufferings. Attraction to the appearances of future lives is reversed. So this is the method of how we can develop that mind of renunciation that not only gives up the attraction to the appearances of this life, but also of future lives within samsara, where we continue to circle under karma and afflictions. So this is all the, the teachings we've got to follow if we want to develop this method we need to overcome excessive emphasis on the appearance of future lives in samsara, just settling for precious human rebirths or, or good states. You know, um, Jetsun, uh, Jetsuma uh, Tenzin Palmo, she, she says so beautifully about how even in Dharma centers, okay, so maybe it relates to you as well, and, you know, I know it's like this for many of us, okay? We get, we just lose our mindfulness. We lose our alertness. We lose our conscientiousness. We just get hooked by these eight worldly concerns. We feel so cozy in samsara that all we seek from samsara, and, and check out if this is what we seek from the Dharma, and if so, it's like danger. Um, all we seek from samsara is just to make life a little bit better, you know? just to be happier. So very rare is it even in Dharma centers, she says, for people to actually want to go beyond samsara. The lips tell us that when we recite our prayers, but in our actions, when we have left the cushion or left the, the gompa, we, we, we become seduced again by the appearances of this life. And so, you know, she says that, you know, 
we're just trying to make ourselves more comfortable. As if we can, like, as if this prison of samsara, we can just paint the walls green and it just, it's just so much more prettier or something like this, you know? Instead of wanting to get out of the prison, we're trying to make ourselves more comfortable in the prison. And I think it's um, really well said because I, I feel that, you know, that's quite often what we're doing. If we can just paint the walls green and put up a few pictures and make everything nice, yeah, then we're going to be happy. And this is just kind of our lives sometimes. So Lama Tsongkhapa is urging us, imploring us to be the fortunate ones to go beyond just making samsara a little bit happier. Okay, so I think that's wise advice from Jetsuma Tenzin Um, What have we got here? Actions and their effects. So, you know, the four characteristics of karma. Try to develop conviction in karma. And, and you know, seeing that karma is definite and it only increases and we'll never experience the result of something we haven't created. And also karma doesn't go to waste life after life. So when this body becomes a corpse, the mind goes on. And on that mind stream are all those karmic seeds that when they meet with the, the right conditions will ripen. Prayers will not be able to stop their ripening. Once they meet with those causes and conditions, that's it. So we've got to purify naturally. So develop as much conviction and karma as we can. Obviously cultivate virtue because virtue is the cause of happiness. Refrain from non-virtue, the cause of suffering. Purify those negativities on our mind stream so that they cannot ripen. Guard the conditions around us. So someone who's you know has an addiction, uh, let's say it's an alcohol addiction, doesn't go and put themselves at the local bar and starts you know hanging out with their drinking mates. Guard your conditions because it's the conditions around that will make ripe those karmic seeds. So we want to guard against destroying virtue with anger and wrong views, but we want to guard the conditions so that we can be cautious about what seeds ripen and uh, really take note of our karma. All right. So that's basically the methods of how we go about developing renunciation. Without suffering, there is no renunciation. That was um, Shantideva. Now, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he says that we can have a look at verse 7 and 8, the beginning lines of 8, of this very prayer. And he says we can apply it in a similar way. But I've noticed I've crossed out enlightenment here. And he says that we can use this verse, if we change enlightenment to renunciation, we can use this verse to help us develop the mind of renunciation. This verse we'll see later because we apply it to other sentient beings to help us develop the mind of enlightenment. But here His Holiness says, using this verse, swept away by the current of the four powerful rivers, tied by the tight bonds of karma so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self-grasping, completely enveloped by the total darkness of ignorance, endlessly born in cyclic existence, ceaselessly tormented by the three sufferings. If we can apply this verse to ourselves at this point, then it's going to help us to develop renunciation. Okay, so if we can focus on our own suffering and how we are, you know, circling in cyclic existence. And if we can develop this renunciation, this self-compassion focused on oneself, compassion, may I be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. You can see how renunciation is self-compassion. Okay. Focused on oneself. So if we focus on our oneself and develop this self-compassion then later, commensurate with that strength, we can apply it equally to others and develop the mind of bodhicitta. 
So we focus on our own suffering, not the suffering of other sentient beings as we would when we're developing a mind of enlightenment. We focus on, notice how that's the only difference here. The mode of apprehension, the wish to be free of suffering and its causes is the same. So it's like the spotlight on self or other. That's the, the only difference between our self-compassion, wishing to be free of suffering, or focused on other sentient beings, wishing they be free of suffering. It's just where that focal object is. It's either ourselves or others. In this case of renunciation, it's ourselves, our own suffering. All right. So these four powerful uh, rivers, we've got desire, existence, ignorance, and wrong views. You can look at the four powerful rivers from a cause or a result. So the cause is desire, existence, ignorance, wrong views, or the result is uncontrolled birth, sickness, aging, and death. Quite often we just look about it from the results. You know, we're, we're caught in samsara, experiencing uncontrolled birth, sickness, aging, and death. But it's because we have um, things like, you know, attachment, desire, craving, grasping, you know, karma, um, existence, um, seeking, you know, even in the, the form and formless realms, you know, is, is this wanting this happiness, uh, this higher form of happiness or, or a higher level Um you know, so or with this ignorance is the main one, this ignorance grasping at herself or any wrong views. So we're, we're swept away, do the visualization at home, we're swept away by the current of the four powerful rivers. But not only are we swept away by this river, we're actually bound and we're bound by karma, you know, so hard to undo once it's taken hold. And not only that is we're, we're in this iron net of self-grasping ignorance, the view of the transitory collection, grasping at a self and an I or mine in one's own continuum to inherently exist. So we're, we're caught by our self-grasping ignorance. But not only that, also we are grasping at a self of phenomena, grasping at the aggregates to be inherently existent. And so when we have this self-grasping ignorance, then what happens along with this, we create, you know, karma and, you know, we, we end up becoming bound by, by all of this karma and afflictions, tormented by three sufferings in cyclic existence. So that's, um, I just want to finish on one thing and then I'll go to the chat. There's something in the chat. So I'm just a mindful of the time and I'm, I probably shouldn't um, go beyond it, which I'm terrible at keeping time usually when it comes to Dharma, I'm terrible. So I just want to focus on this one at the end, the definition of having generated renunciation. Now Lama Tsongkhapa tells us the, the measure, the criteria. We will know that we have generated renunciation when by having trained in that way, there is no arising even for a second of attraction to the perfections of cyclic existence. And all day and night, the intention seeking liberation arises. Then, when you've got those two things, when there's no longer this attraction to the perfections of cyclic existence, and second, day and night, the intention seeking liberation arises, then, that's the measure, then we have this uncontrived mind of definite emergence, renunciation. Okay, so when we can see from the depths of our heart that we can eradicate ignorance, I would suggest you refer to the four truth teaching I did maybe six weeks ago, Muscle Manus, um, on probably looking at, uh, I think it was in the module of true suffering, be how we can overcome it. Otherwise, under true cessations, I might have alluded to it. But there's, you know, wonderful causes and conditions, reasons and logic to support how liberation is possible. And sadly, we don't have the time to go into that, but it is on YouTube for you guys already. So we've got to, the work over the next week is try to give up this attachment to the pleasures of sam samsara. Doesn't mean we've got to renounce the object. Sometimes we might have to initially, but we have to renounce the attachment, the craving, the grasping, the exaggeration that sees that this object brings me happiness. It's not like that at all. 
Happiness is internal. Object is external. So therefore, the cause has to be internal for happiness. Okay? The outside is just a condition. It's not the substantial cause at all. And our delusion projects onto the object thinking it's the cause of our happiness. All right. <clears throat> Conclusion. Uh, when we have renunciation, Kabjay Lama Zubrimshe says, um, when we have renunciation, uh, so we have renunciation when attachment. He said this is light of the past. I think you were there, Erin. Attachment is like using used toilet paper. Hmm, there's a graphic. So when you're on in your bathroom visit, you can bring this to mind. Attachment is like using used toilet paper, but it's not your own. Imagine it's somebody else's. Whatever you can to bring vividly this mind of attachment is what needs to be thrown out, discarded. It is not something to seduce us, okay? We need to throw away what binds us and shackles us to cyclic existence. All right. Okay, how are we traveling? There's something in the chat. Yeah, four rivers. I think I looked at that briefly, Erin. I didn't go into the causal because I haven't had teachings on it, though it's been requested. It wasn't um, um, something that uh, a lama could do for me then and there as I requested. So I haven't had teachings on it to, to go beyond what I elaborated on. Um, Michael, can you voice me? Um, do we have to finish in one minute or three? What have we got? Michael, dear, how many minutes have we got left? We've got a few minutes. If you, I, I don't, I mean, technically we have just like three or four minutes left, but I'm, that will be up to, I think, most of us if you go over by five minutes. Most okay. Of us is, are usually very is someone, understanding and kind of used to it. No one's jumping in on this Zoom link. Okay. All right. So um, I'll just point out, I because I did check the situation. There's no please. no class after this one. Okay. Thank you. I'm no, just shocking. Um, also, if you want to run away because you guys have lives and all of that sort of stuff, um, I don't. Um, but if you want to run away, I'm I'm very happy for you to do so. But I just thought, like an hour and a half, just doesn't seem long enough sometimes. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to have a, a look at. Uh, this briefly and we'll we'll have to do it quite quickly because of the the time factor say that computer cooperate with me but i just thought it might be nice to conclude um now remember at the beginning we invoked lama Tsongkhapa and all of that sort of stuff and we've read through some of his verses but we haven't read through the remaining so just very quickly, I'd like to read through the remaining with you. Um, and if you've got your mute on, you're very welcome and encouraged to read with me as well. So let's continue. The purpose of generating the mind of enlightenment. So we won't read the headings hereafter. Even if renunciation has been developed, if it is not possessed by the mind of enlightenment, it does not become the cause of the perfect bliss of unsurpassed enlightenment. Therefore, the wise generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. Swept away by the current of the four... Oh, excuse me, did I make a mistake? I don't like making mistakes. Let me see. Uh, oh, I don't usually like making mistakes. I might have made a mistake. Can someone see where I've gone wrong? Oh, no, it's just that I've associated with renunciation. My apologies. I'm swept away from by the current of the four powerful rivers, tied by the tight bonds of karma so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self-grasping, completely enveloped by the total darkness of ignorance, endlessly reborn in cyclic existence, ceaselessly tormented by the three sufferings, thinking that all mothers are in such a condition, generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. And then we can skip that. That's Pabon Karimpache's one we'll get to later. Without the wisdom realizing ultimate reality, even though you have generated renunciation and the mind of enlightenment, you cannot cut the root cause of circling. 
therefore attempt the method to realize dependent arising. One who sees the cause and effect of all phenomena of both cyclic existence in the state beyond sorrow is forever unbetraying. And for whom any object trusted in by the grasping mind has completely disappeared, has at that time entered the path pleasing the Buddhas. If the appearance that is unbetraying dependent relation is accepted separately from emptiness, as long as these two understandings are seen as separate, then one has still not realized the Buddha's intent. If these two realizations are happening simultaneously without alternation, and from merely seeing dependent relation as completely unbetraying, the definite ascertainment comes that completely destroys the way all objects are apprehended as truly existent. At that time, the analysis of the ultimate view is complete. Furthermore, appearance eliminates the extreme of existence and emptiness eliminates the extreme of non-existence. If you realize how emptiness manifests in the manner of cause and effect, then you are not captivated by wrong notions holding extreme views. In this way, you realize exactly the vital points of the three principal aspects of the path. Resort to solitude seeking, uh, resort to seeking solitude, generate the power of effort, and quickly accomplish your final goal, my child. So Lama Karpa there, um, you know, we can imagine that he now uh, having taught us these very verses that the purifying nectar and light rays purified all the obscurations and now goes out in this golden light and nectar and brings us the blessings, the inspiration to put these teachings into practice so that we can become exactly like Guru Lama Sankarpa. And so just taking a moment to generate that visualization receiving all the blessings and inspiration. Omagu Vajradasa Matikati Sidi Hum Hum Omagu Vajradasa Matikati Sidi Hum Hum Omagu Vajradasa Matikati Sidi Hum Hum Lama Sankarpa comes to the crown of our head and dissolves through the crown and remains firmly, indivisibly mixed with our extremely subtle fundamental mind. And then just quickly, we can do some dedication prayers. We'll just do this one here. Samsara, Nirvana, like even an atom of inherent existence and cause and effect and dependent arising around betraying. I seek your blessings to discern the meaning of Nagarjuna's thought that these two are mutually complementary and not contradictory. And then may the precious realization of the two stages not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. And then for his holiness, incomparably kind, supreme Tenzingatso, the wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And Rinpoche's, you who uphold the subdurer's moral way of serve as a bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjana's victorious doctrine, who muscly accomplishes magnificent prayers honoring the three sublime ones, save of myself and others, your disciples. Please, please live long. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry it was a bit rushed, but... I just need two hours and then I can go slower uh, or I just need to cull, you know, cut things out or stop rambling. Um, but anyway, hopefully there was some benefit. There's plenty of things I wanted to do that I didn't do. And I would encourage over the, the next uh, week, if you'd like to join us again, I would encourage over the next week that you kind of do this uh, meditation each day. And, you know, remember the, the benefits as you're doing it of needing it to achieve anything from pure refuge, great compassion, liberation, uh, great uh, bodhicitta, enlightenment. You know, we need all of this. Uh, we need this renunciation. And so it has so many benefits for us and uh, is definitely nothing to be overlooked. And maybe you could also remember the reflection we did 
And when you have a problem come up, use trans, transform the problem using renunciation, seeing it as in this is reminding me, a perfect reminder, teaching me to renounce samsara, to be free of all problems. Why wouldn't I expect problems in samsara? And here is one now. And, and of course, we don't like it when it happens. So learning to like it by seeing its value in teaching us to stop painting the walls green and making the room beautiful, making this prison beautiful, get the hell out. Okay. So, you know, using those, those reflections to remember. And then the other thing is just to guard when I'm experiencing an object and generating this exaggerated attachment and pleasure from it, just have some mindfulness come in and check up and um, and recognize uh, that this attachment is actually like used toilet paper. And the cause of my happiness is not in the object. It's actually in my mind from virtue I've created. It's just ripening in relation to this experience right now. But the cause of it is actually virtue. So maybe these are just some of the things we can think about over the next week if you'd like to, to join us again. Thank you, everyone.